Hey everyone, Mark Meckler here, president of Convention Estates. If you watched the previous two units, you heard from my good friend, the late great Dr. Coburn, about the problems that America is facing today. You heard from our senior vice president for legislative affairs, Rita Peters, about the convention, about what the structure looks like and all how it all happens legally. What I wanna do is sort of give you a vision for what it's gonna be like to have a convention and the exciting stuff that could possibly come out of a convention. And let's start with the convention itself. Now, one of the things I love about the idea of calling a convention of states is that what we're gonna see is the largest constitutional education project in American history. And that's not just hyperbole, I'm not overstating the case. And literally, this is gonna be like the Super Bowl, the World Series, the Indy 500, World Cup, if you're a soccer lover, the Stanley Cup, all combined together, everybody in the country is gonna be watching. And when I say everybody, I mean almost everybody. For example, I think you're going to see this in all the schools. Little kids are going to be watching it in their classes. I think in high school and high school government classes, they're going to be watching the convention. I think in college and political science classes, they're going to be watching. I think the convention is going to be featured on the news every night. The major things that happened, the major amendments that were proposed, the great speeches that were given, maybe some of the foibles and the mistakes of the delegates to the convention. I think C-SPAN will be broadcasting it wire to wire, gavel to gavel every single day will be playing in sports bars and pubs around the country. This really is going to be a huge event. It will be literally the largest political event in all of American history. What will we be talking about? What will all the commentators be talking about? I think it's gonna be all over the spectrum, but what they're going to be talking about primarily is the appropriate, the appropriate balance of power, or lack thereof right now, between the federal government and the states. See, because the question asked by Convention of States is, decides and we I and probably you think that the states should decide for themselves that people should decide for themselves not a big government in far away Washington DC or some unaccountable bureaucrat so the first thing we're gonna get is the greatest constitutional education program in American history Lord knows we need constitutional education in this country and what you're gonna see in the convention actually as it breaks out and begins its work, is you're gonna see them discussing, discussing the three subject matter areas that you heard Rita talking about. First, you're gonna hear them talking about perhaps term limits. And when we think of term limits, over 80% of the American people are in support of term limits on Congress. And I think that's a good thing, but you're gonna hear them also talking about term limits for people like bureaucrats and staffers, people that now you and I think of as the deep state. Also possibly term limits for the judiciary. This is going to kind of be really interesting discussions because most politicians are not fans of term limits, but most regular people like you and me are. So I think this is really good to see this discussion around term limits. I don't know what comes out of it. We never know what's going to come out of it, but we do know it's going to be a robust debate. The second area we're going to see them talking about is we're going to see them talking about fiscal restraints on Washington, D.C., now, one thing that you and I know, and it doesn't matter what year you're watching this or what month you're watching this, every year, the deficit grows bigger. Every year, the debt grows bigger in the United States of America. Every administration since the Washington administration, with the exception of Calvin Coolidge's administration, has grown the size and scope of government. Now, I could hear the collective gasp as I say that because you might think, what about the great conservative Ronald Reagan? What about Donald Trump, right? Who went to war against the swamp in Washington, D.C. Well, I got to tell you, under those administrations, yep, government grew as well. And so this is a chance to talk about fiscal restraints on the federal government, things like a balanced budget amendment that requires the federal government to balance its budget every year. A lot of states, the majority of states have these and it's healthy, it's a healthy way to operate and it creates the right incentives for politicians in Washington, D.C. It could be things like tax caps or spending caps tied to the growth of population in the nation or inflation. Uh, these are things that you could talk about when you're talking about fiscal restraints on Washington, D.C. And they're things that probably most Americans would support. So I think these are really healthy debates around the further fiscal health or fiscal decline of Washington, D.C. and thus our entire nation. Finally, and I think most importantly, we're gonna see a discussion around the idea of limiting the scope and the jurisdiction of Washington, D.C. Now those are terms with legal meanings, but I wanna really simplify it. What it means is there's gonna be a debate about Washington, D.C. and what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. 
I think this is really important because right now we have a federal government that's pretty much allowed to do almost anything it wants to do. It intervenes in every area of our lives. And this is certainly not what the framers intended. So for example, we could have a legitimate debate about the Department of Education, Department of Energy, uh, the Department, not say the EPAs, dealing with environmental regulations, health and human services, agencies that deal with our health. And we saw a lot of that when the country went through the quote unquote pandemic and they imposed all kinds of restrictions and restraints on us. And, and they involved themselves in the most intimate details of our health decisions. And so in convention, there could actually be a debate around say, doing away with the Department of Education. I would argue the Department of Education hasn't done our children any good. It's only harmed them. Hundreds of billions of dollars spent, test scores continue to decline. And so why do we have a Department of Education? Why are they taking money from the states, giving it to the federal government? And then the federal government gives some of it back to the states with strings attached. So we could potentially have an amendment that does away with the Department of Education. How about the EPA? The federal government was never meant to regulate the environment. Why is the federal government involved in telling you how you can use your property if you live in Oklahoma or Kansas or New York State or California or where I live in Texas? And the answer is they shouldn't be. Every one of those states has agencies that regulates all that stuff anyway. So if the states, if the citizens of the states want to regulate that stuff on their own, they can choose to do so. There's been a lot of controversy around the composition of the Supreme Court. And when liberals control the Supreme Court, conservatives don't like it and vice versa. And in recent years, people have talked a lot about quote unquote, packing the Supreme Court. What they mean by that is adding enough seats so that liberals can take over the Supreme Court. We could actually prevent that. And there could be a debate at this convention around the idea of limiting the number of justices on the Supreme Court to nine justices. I'm not proposing that. I'm not saying that's the right idea or the right number. Or we should even do a limitation. But I'm saying if that's something that's appealing to you, that's something that's likely to be discussed at convention. Here's another one. We have in recent years heard talk of a treaty, quote unquote, being signed potentially by the president of the United States, giving power over the health and safety of United States citizens to the WHO, the World Health Organization. What a scary thing, giving our sovereignty to a non-state actor that's not Washington, D.C. It's not the states. And by the way, when it comes to health issues, Washington, D.C. has less power even than the states. So to take that power away from the states, give it to a foreign body, the WHO, largely controlled by China, certainly other nations, to give that power away seems really scary. And we could prevent that. That's done right now because the president signs all kinds of things that are actually treaties. He doesn't go to the Senate for approval was never intended to be that way. Anything that looks like a treaty and smells like a treaty, it's a treaty and we should prohibit the president from entering into treaties other than with full Senate ratification. So these are some of the things that we could actually do. Let me throw some out that are sort of more random that you might not be thinking of that make common sense. How about a single subject rule? Now, maybe that you don't know what that is. That sounds obtuse to you. A single subject rule says that when Congress drafts a bill, it can only deal with a single subject. A lot of states have these in their constitution. It prevents things like 2,000, 3,000 page omnibus bills. It would have prevented something like uh, Obamacare, which was a multi thousand page bill. Nancy Pelosi famously said that we could know what's in it. We could read it after they passed it. So we need to prevent that kind of stuff. And you could do that through a single subject amendment. So there are all kinds of things that we could do, we could prevent, I think also this is important, the collusion that's going on today between big business, specifically really big tech and big pharma and the federal government. That's one of the things really damaging our country today. We have this sort of oligarchy, a form of, well, I would argue of fascism where big business and big government are now colluding against the citizens. One way to help prevent that is you could have an amendment that prevents people who serve in the federal government collect a federal paycheck, people who are elected or people who are bureaucrats that are hired or appointed, you could prevent them from ever becoming lobbyists. We right now have a revolving door, right? People go into the administrations, they become bureaucrats, they become staffers, they get elected, they're senators, they're congressmen. They go in, they get a bunch of knowledge and connections, and then they come out and they use that in a very profitable way 
to benefit big business with those relationships by getting stuff done inside the government. Now I'm guessing that you don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. We know that most Americans don't like that. And so what that means is we have to stop it. And you and I can actually stop that by working to see that these things are ratified and then are proposed and then ultimately ratified. Look, in, in the big picture, the way this works, at the end, if we get a bunch of these, is we're going to be more free as citizens. Anytime you can take power and control away from Washington, D.C. and give it back to the states and back to the people, well, then we're more free. The framers told us, the founders told us that the bigger the federal government, the smaller the citizen. The smaller the government, the bigger the citizen. That was true back in 1787, 1789, when the Constitution was ratified, and it's true today. What this will do is create a government that's more accountable to the citizens of the United States of America, less accountable to big business, foreign nations, and to insidious influence. What we really want is we want a government that you're in control of. We want a government that does as little as possible. We want to elevate the self-governing citizen and deflate the controlling government. If this is something that sounds interesting to you, if it's something that sounds exciting to you, and I know, of course, I've dedicated my life to it, it's interesting and exciting to me, then you can get involved if you haven't already done so by going to conventionofstates.com, signing the petition, clicking the Take Action tab, and volunteering. I encourage you, it's not enough to just watch these courses at Convention of States University. I love that you're doing that. I love that you're becoming an educated and involved and informed citizen, but you need to get involved by taking action today.